Yeah, welcome back. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a given Wednesday morning and it gets more interesting every day. This is History Lens and the handsome fellow uh, on the screen is John David Ann. Hi, hi, John. Nice to see your smiley hey, face. Hey. Yeah, you, yeah, you're too kind. I like your comment. <laughs> it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. This is History Lens. Um, and today we're going to talk about a postmortem on the 2020 election and more because so much has happened since election day in 2020. John, you're an historian at HPU, written a lot of books, um, a lot of books about American history. <clears throat> this is um, a very challenging time to try to make sense of it. Have right. you finished making sense of it yet? I think there's light at the end of the tunnel, honestly. Um, you know, it, it, if you had asked me that, uh, yesterday, I would have said I'm still making sense of it. Today, things look clearer to me. So, yeah, I mean, of course, the uh, the attack on the Capitol, the insurrection, unprecedented. Uh, we've never had a domestic terrorist group uh, and insurrectionist attack the Capitol like that before. The only other time the Capitol was attacked, of course, was by the British in the War of 1812. And they burned it to the ground. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, these attackers did not do that. Um, <clears throat> apparently, there was some thought. There was there was somebody. I don't know if they were in the the capital or not, but they had Molotov cocktails, which of course are incendiary devices. And if they had been thrown in the capital, lit and thrown, it could have burned the capital down. So we're lucky that didn't happen. Terrible tragedy that five people died and a and a capital you know police officer died and you know this is uh, it's an unprecedented thing and it's also unprecedented to have the occupant of the white house inciting this mob we've never had in our history a, a sitting president who, who stoked uh, the uh, the fears and the uh, the motivations of such extremism and anti-government extremism it's, it's illogical right it it makes no sense that the government itself the rep the prime representative of the government would encourage protesters to attack the government it's uh, it's completely illogical but uh, there it is. I mean, that's Trump in a nutshell, completely illogical and, and quite dangerous, still very dangerous at this moment. Uh, we don't know what will happen. You know, Jay, you and I talked about this, uh, the, the possibility that the report that there have been uh, threats of threats against, against all of the state protests that all of the state capitals on the 17th, coming Sunday. Um, whoa. There's a lot to deal with, but we, we can put it into some historic, we've already begun to put it into some historical perspective and talk about the election results as well. So it's not all bad. Well, we're learning a lot from it. I think it's a painful lesson and will continue to be a painful lesson until Trump is, is gone, gone, gone. But um, you know, at this point, from a, a, a history professor point of view, um, I would really appreciate your thoughts about what threads came together to make these things happen. I mean, Trump had enablers. It wasn't him alone. He could not have done it alone. And he had, you know, 70 million people vote for him as a cult figure. Right. Um, and so the, the threads in American history, in American sociology, um, you know, contributed to that. And so that if we appreciate that and understand that, maybe we could make, you know, reasonable predictions as to what will happen now. Although I would add to that, you know, the way humanity works, the way history works, one person can change the course of history. We've seen that all through human history. One person can do it. Pence could do it. Trump could do it. Right. Um, Nancy Pelosi could do it. You know, there's all these people that could. So whatever predictions we make, it's subject to, you know, that that um, ephemeral, uh, unpredictable uh, principle that one person could change it. So anyway, what threads are you seeing here in terms of American history and what do they teach us for the future? Right. So uh, part of it is a question about extremism, right? So what's the history of extremism in this country? And 
you know, we've had, and we have to talk about right-wing extremism because of course these were right-wing extremists. This, this, there's been this, this disinformation that this was somehow a false flag operation of Antifa. That is, there is no evidence of that. That is completely false. All of the people who have been arrested uh, have been identified as right-wing extremists, uh, supporters of Trump, supporters of, of QAnon, uh, Proud Boys, this kind of thing. So, but when we look at right-wing extremism, uh, I think we have to look back to the probably the, the 50s uh, is, you begin the 50s and the 60s, you begin to find some examples of, of right-wing extremism. And the, the one that I think of, which is, it wasn't violent, but uh, uh, it was there in the 1950s, was the John Birch Society was a, a complete, you know, if you want to think about the roots of Trump's conspiracy theories, okay, and that's really what drove his campaign in 2012 and then again in 2016. Uh, the root of this lies with the John Birch Society in the 1950s. Now you can go back all the way to all the way to the beginning of American history and find conspiracy theories. I think we've talked about that before, but I mean John Adams, you know, in the in the 1790s running a brothel in the White House. <laughs> There's some crazy stuff. But the thing about the John Birch Society is that the organization was based upon conspiracy theories. The founder of the John Birch Society, Jack Welch, a candy uh, uh, magnet, you know, he sold candy, made lots of money. He wrote a book that was just filled with conspiracy theories that was kind of the founding Bible of this organization. Uh, they believed that the communists had in infiltrated every level of American government they accused uh, uh, Eisenhower and his brother Milton of being communist agents. I mean, it's just this really crazy stuff. Well, can we can we define the the term conspiracy for a minute? And if, I think inherent in the way you, you you know describe it is a conspiracy theory is not true. It's a lie, and it's a lie about how other people are scheming and planning and plotting. Um, to do very nasty, you know, uh, negative things. Is that a fair description of a, a conspiracy theory? Yeah, um, it's it's a it's a lie, and it's a lie about usually about government and about uh, the nefarious, the supposed nefarious actions of government officials. In the case of Jack Welch and I, the Eisenhowers, uh, John uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, president, and and Milton Eisenhower's brother, was that. Uh, President Eisenhower was actually working for Milton, who was the number one communist agent working for the Soviet Union in the country. So the the idea was the conspiracy was that Eisenhower was actually working for the Soviets. Um, completely untrue and really laughable until you begin to think about how uh, conspiracy theories have invaded our politics in the last four years and even you know, af affected uh, the 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 acceptance of this election, and then the the incitement of this uh, this in insurrection that took place last week. Well, you know, it strikes me from what you say that um, that the person who uh, spreads a conspiracy theory knows knows that is not true, but there will be a reason. There will be a reason that this individual spreads it. Let's take Trump, for example. So he spreads a conspiracy theory, encourages it, you know, does all he can to support conspiracy theories. But why? He, he knows that he is throwing disinformation out, out there. What benefit does he get out of doing that? Right. So, so to talk about Trump and conspiracy theories, we have to talk about the birther movement. And this was the movement that started was started essentially by Trump and his supporters in, in uh, during the Obama uh, uh, presidency that somehow Barack Obama was actually not born in the United States and therefore could not legitimately be president of the United States. And therefore his entire presidency was illegitimate. And so uh, the benefits so this is the conspiracy theory that gained ground 
you know, it, that first Trump run, and then of course it really gained ground at, towards the 2016 election. And uh, this is, so what Trump gained out of this was he gained a movement. Uh, there were lots of people who actually believed what Trump said when he started, you know, when, when this conspiracy theory was spread, they, be, they actually believed it. I mean, I have friends whose parents actually believed this. So there's no truth to this. I mean, Obama released his birth certificate. There's no truth to this, but, but nonetheless, the benefit for Trump was he developed a movement. And actually, I think this eventually gained him the presidency because he decided, Trump decided, look, uh, one conspiracy theory works. Why not a whole raft of lies and conspiracy theories and denials? And so essentially he based his presidency on this. Uh, so, um, you know, that's one of the real dangers that took place over the last four years. And it's something we still, we still have to fight against is this idea that, that, uh, that Donald Trump can say it's false news and therefore it's fake. Uh, you know, or he can, you know, consider an election illegitimate and therefore it's, you know, without any evidence, it's, it's illegitimate. There was no evidence of widespread fraud in this election. It was tested by over 60 lawsuits and they didn't find any. Uh, and yet there was, there's a sizable part of the American population who at least a few days ago before the insurrection believed that this election was illegitimate. Uh, that there was somehow massive fraud, which had which had resulted in Joe Biden's win and stolen the election away from Donald Trump. Complete falsehoods. Yeah. But nonetheless, you know, so there was a very interesting <laughs> uh, social media video by Arnold Schwarzenegger, who yeah. was a child. You know, I think he was born after after the war um, in Europe, and he spoke about what happened in Europe because uh, there, there were people who bought into that, the way a lot of American people are buying into it, bought into Hitler's big lie. Mm -hmm. And the big lie continued after the war. Um, and then there was this moment of revelation where they realized that it was a lie, and then they felt terribly guilty. Yeah. And it was, a, you know, they, they never got over it. His, his parents, his, his gener the parents' generation you know, never really got over it. They were guilty. For, for believing that for the rest of it. So anyway, my point is that, um, you know, the big lie is what Hitler used to get into power. And that's what we have here. We have the big lie. We have multiple big lies, outrageous lies that Trump has been doing. And my question to you is, is there kind of a, a, a soft point in American culture and history, maybe different, maybe worse than what happened in Europe, where perfectly middle-class people who could make you know, rational decisions, all of a sudden bought into the big lie. And here we have 70 million plus people who have bought into a lot of big lies, not only Bertha, but all the lies yep. since then, they completely accept them. Is this a flaw in American society? <laughs> no, I mean, as you pointed out, Jay, uh, other nations have, have experienced this where uh, demagogues, a demagogue defined as a systematic liar, demagogic pop politicians like Adolf Hitler uh, told lies that, uh, that were effective, that people actually believed and wanted to believe. So here's the thing about it. If this is important. The Hitler example is quite important because this is really when historians began to study the big lie it was after World War II and we studied Hitler's big lies in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, the main big lie that Jews were responsible for the, the German loss in World War I. Now we have to understand that, first of all, the Germans lost the war and there was this loss psychosis or, or, or psychology. People were very angry and upset about the loss and, and the elites were upset about the loss. And so they were open, right? They were open to the idea that somehow uh, we could blame one particular group. And of course, Jews who were quite prominent in German uh, and Austrian society, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in not in politics so much, but in, um, uh, in business uh, and in, in the professions uh, were actually the cause of this. But Jews of course had been 
attacked in there was a strong anti-Semitism already existing in Germany. So that made it an easy play for Hitler. Let's blame the Jews, right, for this. And, and so you have to have a public that's ready to believe the lie. Okay. And I think that was that's kind of true with this with the, this election because Donald Trump uh, did such a good job preparing uh, the way, doing groundwork that this is a you know, fraudulent election. The postal service is, is screwing up. The mail and ballots are, can, you know, fraud will happen with them. So he laid the groundwork for this lie. And then you, of course, you also have the pandemic, which made people put people on edge. It made people concerned about their futures. It put fear in their hearts. And anytime you put fear in the hearts of people who are maybe not very educated or, or uh, you know, prone to kind of uh, like strong men or demagogues, then uh, the, the ground can be laid. So the ground for this particular circumstance, I think was laid by the pandemic uh, and laid by Trump himself. Um, and, and, you know, the, of course, what goes along with the pandemic, unemployment and, and fear for, you know, what's going to happen to us, what's going to happen to uh, our culture, our family. And this kind of, the, the cultural fears, of course, have been stoked uh, over maybe a couple of decades uh, that uh, somehow the, uh, the, the real conservative, conservatism in the United States is being lost that we should somehow return to the 1950s and have that kind of a society. Uh, yeah, a white, a white society. Right. That's inherent right. in the birther issue, yeah. inherent in the, uh, in the Capitol um, insurrection last week um, is, is the, the fact that Trump, Trump is playing on racial prejudice. He's yeah. playing against the blacks. I don't know if people clearly see that, but if you connect the dots, what you get is a racist. Yeah. And he's going after the blacks and the Mexicans. Yeah, no, it's quite true. Um, and this is, uh, you know, in times of distress uh, in American history, you uh, this has also been so like uh, anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, anti-black, and uh, you know, racism uh, and demagoguery against blacks, and then violence against blacks. Very common response in times of distress. After World War I, for instance, uh, troops come home, the economy falls into a depression, a, pardon me, a recession. And then of course you have a pandemic as well in 1919, 1918 and 1919. And so there's great fear in the country. And what happens, there are race riots throughout the, you know, throughout the country in all of the major cities. And these race riots are not started by African-Americans, they're started by white mobs go into African-American neighborhoods and begin to kill people and burn down buildings. Uh, it's, it's really horrible uh, what happens in 1919. But yeah, so, so this process of, you know, in academic, academia, we call this the process of othering, creating an other who you can hate, who you can despise, who you just- Scapegoat, despise. scapegoat. Yes, it kind of, yeah, I mean, the popular vernacular scapegoating, yeah. So, this is very common. It's very important to, to have a scapegoat if you're going to perpetuate a big lie or a conspiracy theory like Trump had. So, you know, immigrants, right? Mexicans, Muslims, and now Trump, Trump has never said, you know, blacks, but in so many words, he has said uh, blacks. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's pretty wild stuff. So, um, and, you know, the, of course, there were, uh, there were, uh, uh, Insurrectionists who had insurrectionists had the Confederate flag. That's a, that's a white supremacist symbol there. Uh, so yeah, definitely racism. Yeah, in the birther movement itself, this is uh, you know at its most basic level, the birther movement was the expression of whites who were fearful of a black putting a black man in the White House would allow him to dominate them. Blacks need to stay in their place. That's their thinking. They don't belong in the White House, and we certainly can't have them dominating us, lording back to slavery in the Civil and War. There is a there is a psychology that runs through American history from slavery that that involves this fear of domination uh, because you know quite frankly uh, you know whites dominated blacks and then 
you know, what's what's to stop blacks turning the table? Why wouldn't they, with their resentment, try to dominate whites? This has been a fear for a long time. You see it in the development of the in the uh, const state constitutional conventions that took place in the between the 1820s and the 1870s. There was discussion: Okay, do we give free blacks in these northern states, in you know Michigan, Ohio, Indiana? Uh, there's 24 states that that bring that become states and have to write state constitutions in that time period. And almost none of them allow African-Americans full civil rights. Uh, and and they're, they're, they say this, I mean, they admit, well, we do not want the black man lording over us. We, don't, we do not want the black man to be our master. These are paraphrases of quotes from these constitutional convention proceedings. Another example, and that in, you know, it's part of this is the state of Oregon, right? We consider Oregon to be a kind of a, a progressive icon, and especially Portland, right? It's a you know progressive city, should be very racially progressive. It's the whitest city, it big large city in the United States, six percent African American. Oh. Uh, the, the, the state of Oregon, when it came into the union, had the most restrictive laws against. Af against African-Americans in the nation. It came into the union in 1859 and it had a law completely exclu excluding, pardon me, completely excluding African-Americans from the state. You could not even go there to reside. So what, you know, what you described and what's, you know, has always seemed clear is that the U.S. has some, some flaws in this department. We have the scapegoating flaws, we have the racial division, racial uh, racism. Um, and we have things that Trump could have capitalized on, and he did. He did that in order to uh, become a cult figure and, and get power. And so here we are when he's, you know, he's gone as far or further, much further than he's ever gone. He's created the attack on the Capitol. He, um, he is likely to, well, he is also creating attacks on state, state uh, capitals around the country, talking about having a million a million people, a million men, <laughs> didn't talk much about the women, a million men, uh, you know, show up in, in Washington and elsewhere, uh, which uh, I don't know if it's going to happen in that number, but it's going to happen in some number. So, you know, really the, the uncomfortable question is, if we, look at, if we look at what has happened under Trump, and we realize that these flaws have existed uh, open for opportunistic, you know, opportunistic leverage all this time. And he has found the leverage just the way Hitler found the leverage in, in Europe. Where does that take us? And what kind of forces can play against that, push back against that yeah. to, to clarify, you know, our society and, and make it safe again? Yeah, so uh, of course, a very different situation than Germany. Uh, Germany in the 1920s was a democracy, but it was a very young democracy. Uh, Germany had suffered uh, an insurrection in, right after World War I, a very unstable democracy. They didn't really, you know, the people of Germany uh, uh, had been, th there was a kind of a very kind of authoritarian democracy even before World War I, but it was very much hamstrung by the monarch, of course, the Kaiser before World War I. But so you have this democracy that is uh, very kind of in its infant stages and it's unstable and it's made even more unstable by the fact that their economy just ground to a halt with hyperinflation in 1923 and 24. So, uh, so it's not the same situation. The United States, we've had a, a democracy for over 200 years. Um, and it's, it's a democracy that has actually grown. Okay, you know, elites voted in the 1790s, by the 1840s, then all whites voted uh, after World War, after the Civil War, then uh, African Americans, at least technically, kind of theoretically, had the African American males had the right to vote. Uh, then uh, the, in the early 20th century, then women got the vote. And then in the Civil Rights era, then voting rights were encapsulated for all American citizens. So we have grown in our democracy. And uh, I think actually that history really matters. I think our experience of democracy really matters. And I think we're seeing that now that 
those who value the Constitution, those who value our democracy and democratic values are coming to the fore and they're pushing back really hard. One of the big uh, questions that, that has emerged out of what happened last week, John, and I think there'll be a lot more discussion of it, uh, is who exactly was in that mob? Uh, and, you know, they, they may have worn uh, crazy clothing um, and, and those hats and everything. One, one fellow uh, who was the son of a judge in Brooklyn, right. I find that very interesting. <laughs> uh, the one without the clothes on with, yeah, with the Viking hat. Yes. Um, you know, uh, we don't know yet. We don't have a profile of who is there. I mean, I, I guess you could say that it's a lot of profiles. They come from all over the place, but it's hard to find a, a common denominator what would bring people together in that sort of uh, absurdity. And, and I guess one, one of the things that strikes me, and I think it will strike me more as we learn more, is that a lot of the people there were middle class, had a home and a car. A lot of the people there had ordinary lives, um, and uh, including police officers, including police officers. Even there was a, you know, a legislator and there was this fellow Ox who has been arrested here in Hawaii, who ran for office as a conservative. I yeah. mean, people, people from all walks, including ordinary walks of life in this country have yeah. been involved, not only in the movement, but in the violence. And that to me is totally remarkable. And question, how do you clean that up? How do you, how do you show them that's not the way? How do you correct this? you know, extraordinary violation of our government. So, uh, first of all, we do know uh, where some of them, you know, what their affiliations are, what's driving this. And uh, we know that there was a pretty widespread representation by Proud Boys, which is a, a fairly new right-wing extremist organization founded in 2017 in New York. Um, but their, their leader actually was headed to the march and he was arrested on his way to the march uh, last Wednesday. Um, we also know that uh, QAnon supporters uh, were there, uh, you know, another right-wing extremist the conspiracy theory organization. Uh, and we, we think there's another organization here which is very shadowy called Boogaloo. And the, book, the difference with Boogaloo is they're not just there protesting. They have as a part of their charter, the destruction of the United States government. They wanna start a civil war. Uh, so they're very kind of out in the open with their extremism, uh, but, but it's hard to identify them because they don't have much of an organizational apparatus. The other two do. And so, you know, one response of course of the government, and this is, happened in the past is that the government prosecutes these, these organizations. You, you can do, uh, uh, you know, hate crime uh, uh, kind of racketeering uh, prosecutions, which actually hit them financially and put them out of business this way. This has happened uh, many times in the last 20 years, actually, in the northwest part of the country and in Michigan, where you have these organizations that crop up like the White Knights and uh, uh, and you know the, the the Christian identity movement and and uh, there's there's, I, there's a whole there's a lot of them and uh, uh, neo Nazi groups and and uh, the government the government knew about these and so they prosecutors went to work and they uh, and they put these organizations out of business by uh, by uh, you know with financial uh, racketeering charges. So you can get rid of the organizational structure. That's not such a concern. It's the ideas and the lies that are much harder that are kind of, uh, you, that you, have to, you have to work at a much deeper level to get rid of uh, conspiracy theories. You're not gonna get rid of conspiracy theories. You simply have to do a better job of communicating with the public and educating the public as to how to read media. And you also have to have social, so that involves me, right? I'm an educator. And so what I do now, I added an assignment in my uh, American history course called a fake news report. I want, I want students, to, I ask students to go out and find a, a, an example of fake news. Tell me why it's fake news. Tell me what's true about it. So just basically distinguishing fact from fiction 
And, and then the other thing is that uh, the social media companies need to be held accountable and they're holding, they're now holding themselves more accountable. So it's a bit belated. Uh, they knew about these groups for a long time and they've tolerated this in the name of free speech. Uh, but the thing is, look, there are limits to free speech. I mean, Rousseau made this very clear. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, the Enlightenment philosopher said, hey, in the social contract, he said, look, we're, we're, humans need to move from a kind of animal state of freedom to a civil liberty where the power of the government can protect and, and place limits upon freedoms because uh, he's kind of, this kind of idea that, that there's no boundary to freedom is a dangerous notion. Well, yes, it goes back to Hugo Black in one of the uh, Supreme Court cases where he said, you cannot cry fire in a crowded movie theater. There are limits. And, uh, and we're, we're seeing people bounce off those limits now. But you'd like to offer something based on what you just said. It's, you know, it sounds like, you know, we, yes, these organizations, the government, the FBI can, you know, contain them and may, even make them go away and has over time. And then they pop up again because the thread of this kind of uh, ultra conservatism still exists in the country. Um, yeah. But you know, one thing is this: this insurrection last Wednesday acts as a kind of lightning rod. What it says is all that noise about free speech, all that noise about your right to, you know, to protest and and carry on like that. You know that you really did some damage here. And um, the government, the FBI and whatnot, uh, now has um, a, a basis for going after the people who were there, those ultra conservatives who were there on the basis of what happened. And they're going to, they're going to arrest, they're going to find them, they're going to arrest them, they're going to prosecute them, they're going to punish them. Um, and so it, it offers an opportunity to, 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 to cleanse, that's the wrong word, but you know, to, to take care, to take care of that group, to contain that group and to show them that they, they can't do this. OK. Um, and my, I guess my question is, is that going to work uh, or will they just come on back again? Uh, will the fact that there be a lot of prosecutions here and social media, you know, uh, is closing down Trump and the like and big business is not supporting candidates who want to run an ultra conservative uh, you know, uh, campaigns. Is that going to solve the problem? Does it go anywhere to solve the problem? And does it solve the problem in, in a larger sense? Yeah, so I think it, it, it definitely makes a huge difference. Look, we've never had a demagogue as president before. And now uh, the, the Congress, and I, I, I think there's a chance that he will be impeached. Uh, the, you know, Mitch McConnell now has spoken out in favor of impeachment. The Republican leadership, they're afraid for their party. And so they're gonna fight. What's going to happen now is probably a civil war in the Republican party, which is needed, uh, speaking of cleansing. Uh, but so, yeah, so I think uh, this is, it's a moment, it's a kind of hinge. It's a, a, a turning point in history where Americans now are much more awakened to the dangers of this because we actually had to live with this for four years. And it almost ended in a, you know, in a coup d'etat. So uh, I think this is a moment where uh, uh, many Americans are waking up to this. You're not gonna get rid of this, but do we ever want to have a demagogue for president again? In our political leadership, I have a hard time seeing how that's going to happen. As at least a Trump type president, he, Trump has so damaged uh, that movement with this action that I don't think that movement uh, has a future at the national level, at the highest levels of government. They, they'll still be around. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But um, I think they're done in terms of leading national politics. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it, we, the other thing this shows is we still have strong civil institutions beyond just our government. We have in our, <clears throat> our nonprofit sector, in our advocacy institutions, uh, in our businesses, we have a, a much stronger social consciousness about the dangers of this kind of stuff now. So I think the, I, I'm quite heartened by the, 
the, the very strong response of, uh, you know, of uh, kind of the business community and, and the, you know, and, and civic institutions to this, because it, democracy is not just built on the vote. It's, it's built up, it's got this whole layer of civic organizations and NGOs that support democracy. It's not just built upon the government. Okay. So it's, these are these responses are very important. So yeah, yeah I, be one of those Second Amendment guys who carries guns around. And now I fully understand why Trump and his friends were advancing the Second Amendment, because they understand that one person with a gun is worth thousands without guns. Yeah. Um, that, that's where it went. But let me let me ask you this, John, in, in closing, I just, a point of curiosity. Um, you say, and I certainly agree that it's a matter of educating people to do critical thinking and not to be sucked in by demagogues. And, and, we, and that's the way we can you know, beat this in the long term. But, and we, and we know right now today, I'm sure you know them as well as I do. There are people in our community, all up and down, all up and down. It's not just uh, you know, uh, some, some right-wing police that you might meet but it's business people, it's military people, it's, and they're Trumpers, or at least until last Wednesday, they were Trumpers, and they were likely to continue as Trumpers, and students. And my last question to you, John, is when, when you talk to your classes, and you have them identify the fake news, you get to think of how they think, you get to think of what their orientation is right now. Do you find, have you found, that in your classes, there are Trumpers. Um, no, uh, you know the Trump Trumpers are nearly non-existent at the university level. There's a very small minority. You know, most vast majority of college students voted for Biden. They didn't vote for Trump. In fact, college students came out in much bigger numbers than previously and voted for Biden. So that's a really good thing. Now, um, the, the thing is. You have to kind of think about this as subsections of the Dem of the Republican Party. You know, you have you have one section of the Republican Party that's the, they're they're Trump crazies, right? They're they're irrational. They they don't really know how to think critically about much of anything. That might be twenty percent. It might be twenty five percent. It could be up to you know to thirty percent of the party. Um, uh, you know, but but then. There's other Republicans, many other Republicans, about you know another uh, fifty percent of Republicans who voted for Trump. And so what you're going to see in the Republican Party is this kind of shedding taking place over the next several months. It's very clear where this, what direction this train is moving, and now and it, it's a really good thing. It's a really important thing that it's begun to move in the direction of removing. Uh, the, the Trump influence from uh, American national politics. So that's crucial. One, one thing that's happening, John, is that whatever is happening, whatever movement we have, it's fast. And uh, you and I, uh, we, we're here on a given Wednesday. Um, who knows what the conversation might be a week from today? Uh, anything could happen. I, I hope uh, you'll be available to continue our conversation so we can take stock of how these things play out. Thank you so much, John. It's always, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and learn from you. Yeah, you're welcome, Jay. Great to be on the show. Take care. Take care. Aloha.